Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we journey back in time to the birth of one of the most remarkable goddesses of all time, Hera, the goddess of marriage, women and family, and the queen of the gods. We will follow her life of power, beauty, tragedy, and love, from her birth to her marriage to Zeus, the god of the sky, and one of the most powerful gods on earth. We will spend some lazy, peaceful days with her in the gardens of the Hesperides, where she gradually grew into the goddess we all know today. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations, there are no responsibilities. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, you are already providing your body with the rest and nourishment that it needs. You are slowly healing yourself and giving yourself the gift of rest, whether you are falling asleep or not. Together, we will gradually work our way towards sleep, but know that every step of the way, you are nourishing both your body and your mind. With your eyes closed and your body sinking deeper, and deeper into the mattress beneath you. Take a moment to really feel the points of contact you have with the mattress. Notice how your legs, arms, torso, and head feel as they are embraced by the soft bed beneath you. After a long day, they are being invited to let go of any weight they have been carrying, as are you. For a moment, let us imagine that you are not lying in your bed. Instead, you are reclining peacefully on a big, fluffy white cloud. It is as soft as cotton and it wraps around you as if you are sinking into the world's most comfortable beanbag chair. Though the cloud itself is wispy and otherworldly, and you can brush your fingers through its outer edges, it is sufficiently dense and supportive and plush beneath you making you feel protected, no matter where the cloud may be floating. Bits of the cloud rise up around you, cradling you like a soft blanket. It curls up beneath your chin, around your shoulders, over your arms and legs. It provides you with a layer of warmth and comfort unlike anything else. You feel like you are truly being embraced by the cloud. Slowly, the cloud begins to move down from the sky at a steady, gentle pace. You are floating effortlessly down toward the lush and wild landscape on the earth below you. 
There are nothing but meadows and forests splashed across the countryside. You can't see any houses for miles, and you like it that way. The cloud glides down so you are skirting just above the beautiful, breathtaking countryside. You feel like a bird sailing above the world, taking it in from an entirely new, life-changing angle. You soar around trees and over meadow grasses, close enough so you could reach out and touch them if you'd like to. And so, you do. With gentle fingers, you extend your hand out over the edge of the cloud. You're moving at a slow and steady pace between the trees and just over the grasses. Your fingers brush over leaves and wildflowers and blades of grass caressing them with a magic touch. You let your hand dangle there, mingling with the flowers and leaves and beautiful earth that is moving so smoothly all around you. Overhead, there are clouds much like the one you are lying on. They are cottony puffs against a baby blue sky, so elegant and perfect that it feels like they were plucked out of a nostalgic dream long, long ago. When you take a deep breath in, tasting the nectar of the wildflowers and the freshness of the air, you notice that the clouds above you grow thicker taking up almost the entire sky. When you breathe out, the clouds slowly recede and disappear, revealing more of that stunning baby blue sky to you. You breathe in deeply and wholly, watching as the sky dims with clouds above you. Then, you exhale, feeling the sunlight wash over your skin as the clouds clear more and more. You breathe in, watching more clouds gather in the beautiful sky above you. And you exhale, feeling the sunlight Splash across your smooth skin as the clouds clear, revealing more of that brilliant sky. Know that you can return to this visual at any time to ground yourself in your breathing and to recognize the ability you have inside you to relax and soothe yourself to visualize anything that you would like. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now, let us begin our story. Hera was born soon after the universe itself was born, brought to the earth as the child of the great Titan Cronus and Titaness Rhea. She was a sibling of many powerful gods, Hades, Poseidon, Demeter, Hestia, and her eventual husband, Zeus. Soon after Hera and the others were born, however, the Titan Cronus learned of his destiny 
that he would be overthrown by one of his children, a being obsessed with power and the ability to have control over others. Cronus could simply not bear the thought of being overthrown by one of his children. Despite his wife's begging, he decided the only way to prevent this from happening was to swallow his children whole. Rhea, however, loved her children more than she loved any kind of power, more than she loved Cronus himself. When Cronus asked for his youngest child Zeus so that he could swallow him, Rhea instead handed him a heavy stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. The Titan picked the stone up between his fingers and swallowed it, none the wiser. Satisfied that his position of power was saved, Cronus happily went about his days. Rhea had hoped that Zeus would be able to save his siblings, including the beautiful and intelligent Hera. Rhea sent Zeus away in the dead of night to the island of Crete, urging him to grow big and strong so that one day he could return and recover his siblings from his father. Eventually, that day came. Zeus returned to his homeland, and with some clever trickery, he had his father drink a vomit-inducing potion. Cronus first disgorged a stone, followed by all of Zeus's siblings one by one. A long and arduous series of battles ensued in which the older generation of Titans, headed by Cronus, fought against the new generation of gods, led by Zeus, that would later become known as the Olympians. This war was called the War of the Titans. In the end, the Olympians and their allies prevailed, and Cronus, together with most of the other Titans, were sent to Tartarus, where they would never have to be seen again. And so, once more, Hera was delivered into a beautiful new world. However, She was not to be raised like her siblings on Mount Olympus. By some accounts, Hera was raised and lived her early life in the gardens of the Hesperides, and, my, were the gardens of the Hesperides a beautiful place to grow and learn. The gardens of the Hesperides were a lush, vast series of gardens far, far away from the world. It was said to be the most beautiful place on the entire earth, and very few people or gods were allowed to go there. The Hesperides, or the Western Maidens, resided in the flourishing gardens They were the nymphs of the evening, representations of the golden light simmering across the horizon and sweeping over the mountains at the end of every day. They fit their roles perfectly. They were beautiful, calm, contemplative, joyful nymphs. Their hair was strawberry blonde and a deep, rich red and ginger. Their clothes seemed to be sewn from silk and gold itself. 
glistening with every single graceful step they took across the gardens. Every evening, they would lead the way before Nyx caused the sun to set, working in unison to paint the sky and the land in the stunning blanket of marigold light. They spent their days lazing in the gardens and basking in the light of the sun, soaking in the rays as if it nourished them, as if it fueled them. They were nymphs that enjoyed life for exactly what it was and soaked it up in a way that few other creatures did. That being said, it was a fairly easy thing to do in a place as wildly beautiful as their gardens. Lakes dotted the mountainous landscape full of rolling evergreen hills. Lakes that seemed to always have a glassy sheen to them, never peppered with white caps never blemished by a single wave. The sun and clouds were reflected in them like a perfect mirror. And when the sun set with the help of the Hesperides every evening, the lakes were a portrait of gold and orange. There were rivers that rushed down the mountain slopes, drawn between the trees as if Mother Nature herself had taken her finest brush and painted them there in long, winding strokes. The rivers bubbled over rocks and around bends, but they were perfectly, perfectly clear you could see the rainbow mosaic of stones blanketing the bottom of the river. Stones of pink, orange, blue, and purple. Stones that were freckled with specks of black, white, and gray. Each dot more stunning than the last. And then there were the plants and flowers of the garden Though the Hesperides hardly had to tend to them, the gardens were the finest that existed anywhere on earth. Fruits and berries and nuts sprung from them with abundance, coating the landscape with oranges, greens, yellows, reds and purples. There was always enough food to go around, so much that one could pluck a full meal from a single bed within the garden. There were orchards as far as the eye could see, but none were quite as special as Hera's orchard. She spent most of her time there, tending to the apple trees and olive trees and citrus trees. She truly loved nature in a way that few people are able to. She swore she could feel the soil breathing beneath her feet. She could feel the plants asking her for water and offering her their bounty with glee. She spent many of her childhood days in that orchard, pruning the trees and gathering their fruit in wooden baskets. She walked barefoot nearly all the time through the garden, savoring the feeling of the soil and soft, soft evergreen grass on her feet. When she wasn't tending to the garden, she was often playing with the Hesperides. 
they would bathe in the rivers together and spend time unwinding in hot springs. Sometimes they would gaze up at the clouds and call out their imagined shapes. They loved to play tag alongside the rivers and sing songs to one another beautiful songs that could bring a tear to your eye. Their lives together there were peaceful and full of days with nothing but joy and beauty. However, as is often the case, those days could not last forever. As Hera grew older, Her carefree days of having leaf races down the meandering streams and lounging relaxed in wildflower-coated meadows grew less and less frequent. The other gods, her siblings, came to visit her rather often. After all, she was a sibling of Zeus, and a goddess of immense power. She loved her sisters, though she had a distaste for Zeus of all the gods. She had heard of his numerous liaisons with women, gods and humans and nymphs alike. She knew he was a man who often brought tragedy with him, and she questioned his decision-making skills at her very core. But Hera was happy she didn't have to see Zeus that often. She spent many of her days chatting with her other siblings as she worked barefoot in the garden. Some of her siblings teased her for not using the full extent of her abilities. But Hera didn't mind it too much, because some days she used them as much as she liked. Sometimes she would lie down in the soft meadows of the gardens, the sweet grass dancing around her, the crickets chirping in their cozy nooks and crannies in the trees, at the edge of the grass. When she was sure no one else was watching, she would reach up toward the clouds and brush her hands over them, taking hold of them elegantly. With ease and cool, gentle breaths, Hera was able to mold the clouds into whatever she desired. She could form them into shapes She could cause more to appear. She could make them disappear at will. She had the power to control and move the skies, a power that was only matched by Zeus himself. And soon, Zeus became aware of this. From a hiding spot, he watched Hera for quite some time as she went about her life in the gardens of the Hesperides. He admired her more and more with each passing day. The way she cared for the earth, the way she went about her daily business with a smile on her face, and especially the way she cared for the animals of the garden. Hera was a goddess who loved animals with every fiber of her being. Zeus watched one day as a bird fell from a nest, hurting its wing. To Zeus, the stunning little sparrow was a lost cause. There were millions more exactly like it flying through the forests and skies of their land. He expected Hera to move along 
and continue about her day, ignoring the little bird. But instead, Hera looked down at the wounded animal with tears shimmering in her eyes. She knelt in the grass, staining her bare knees and the hem of her beautifully woven dress a bright, rich green. Dirt and freshly wet soil stuck to her soft skin, but she paid it no mind. Her focus was almost entirely on the sweet little bird that was flapping its good wing and calling out to the world, asking for someone to help it. Hera clicked her tongue against her teeth and shook her head sadly. You poor little thing, she muttered to the bird. As gently as she could, she scooped the incredibly small animal into the soft palm of her hand. At first, the bird called out, afraid of her touch. But Hera soothed it with her melodic voice, promising the bird that she would not harm it. It was clear that as soon as the bird touched Hera, it could feel her energy. It nestled its downy little head against Hera's fingertips, gazing up at her with affectionate eyes. Hera smiled down at the bird, promising to take care of it and help it grow big and strong so it could survive out in the gardens. And that is precisely what she did. Zeus watched as hours turned to days and days turned to weeks. And with each passing moment, Hera tended to the bird Every morning, she would awaken and head out into the gardens, using her bare hands to dig in the earth for worms to feed the bird. She didn't mind the feeling of the damp, fresh soil on her hands, nor the earthy, fragrant aroma that danced in the air as she searched through the rich loam. Eventually, without fail, she would find a few worms buried in the soil. She would plop them into one of her hands, and then, with the other hand, she would wander around the gardens for a few moments, gathering whatever seeds the flowers and plants had dropped overnight. Then, with a smile on her face, just as the sun began to rise, she would sit with the bird and feed it by hand. The bird would slowly pick at the seeds, being careful that it was gentle enough not to harm Hera's soft skin. When it was finished, each and every day, it would nuzzle against Hera affectionately, curling its head and injured wing against her fingers. It was clear that the bird trusted Hera with its life, and Hera loved it with all of her heart. Zeus had never seen a creature and a human interact in such a way. Hera had nothing but love in her heart for the creatures of the forest. It wasn't just the birds, Zeus soon learned. It was the small mammals, the fish swimming in the pond, even the bees and butterflies that glided through the gardens, pollinating the flowers, and in turn, it seemed that all the animals loved Hera, too. 
They frequently scurried out of the forests when they saw Hera coming, eager to be near her, to hear her honey-sweet voice as she sang to them, or asked them how their days were going, knowing she would never get an answer. Soon, the bird grew big enough to be released, Its wing was healthy and fluffy with beautifully sheen feathers. Hera stood at the edge of her home with the little bird in her hands. She gave the bird a tearful goodbye, wishing it well as it continued its life in the gardens. The bird nuzzled against her hand a final time before it took off into the garden, melding in with the color of the sky until it disappeared from view. Zeus watched from his hiding spot as Hera fought tears for the little bird. She was happy to have saved it, but filled with sorrow at the thought of parting with it. Zeus was overcome by emotion, seeing Hera so vulnerable and connected to the world. He knew in that instant that he wanted to be with Hera, that she would be his bride. The other gods had been saying for quite some time that Hera was the only reasonable match for Zeus. She was beautiful, intelligent, and her power was the only power that rivaled his own. Their mother, of course, was against the union, but Zeus paid no mind to that. Desperate to have Hera as his wife, Zeus descended from his hiding place to woo her It was normally easy for Zeus to woo women, nymphs, and goddesses alike, so he was not shy of approaching her at all. He walked in the garden with her, talking with her for quite some time. He didn't notice that Hera was stepping away from him, uninterested and clearly wishing he would leave. Zeus's confidence and narcissism didn't allow him to see the disregard that she clearly had for him. And so, at the end of the day, as the Hesperides set off to paint the landscape in a stunning array of gold and orange, Zeus asked Hera to be his bride. Hera took a step back, shocked and displeased by the sudden question. After all she had heard of Zeus, a simple walk in the garden with him could not change her opinion of him. She turned Zeus down without any particular gentleness. She knew he was someone that didn't take no for an answer, so she tried to be as transparent as she could be. Zeus left the garden in a whirlwind. He could not believe he had been rejected by Hera. He had never wanted a woman as his bride like he wanted Hera. And so, though it was incredibly inappropriate, Zeus continued to pursue her. Morals were not Zeus's strong suit after all. For several days, for several weeks, for several months, Zeus came to the garden to try and talk to Hera into marrying him. Some days, Hera would walk along the river with him and talk to him. Others, she would instantly send him away, tired of his propositions. She was growing more and more frustrated with Zeus with every passing day. And Zeus, too, 
was growing tired of Hera's rejections. He thought back to the moment that made him fall for her and desire her as a bride. Her tending to that lost and injured bird, helping give it a fighting chance to survive. The way she loved animals and connected with them was unlike anything Zeus had ever seen. And it was then that Zeus came up with a plan. Knowing how dearly Hera cared for animals, he believed if he was an animal, he could make her fall in love with him. One night, as Hera curled up in her bed with a fireplace crackling by her feet, Zeus sent a massive storm over the gardens. Hera paid it no mind, enjoying the sound of the rain against the roof overhead. Zeus transformed himself into a beautiful cuckoo bird and descended into the storm. By the time he reached Hera's house, he was soaked to the bone, hardly able to keep flying. He crash-landed on the windowsill with a thud, alerting Hera to his presence. She rose from bed, casting her woven blanket aside and clutching a hand to her chest as she made her way over to the window to investigate the noise. When she reached the windowsill and saw the cuckoo lying there, its feathers disheveled, its entire body quivering with the cold of the rain, her guard immediately fell. You poor dear, she muttered in her smooth, sweet voice. Gently, perhaps even more gently than she had picked up the sparrow, she picked up Zeus in his cuckoo form. She remarked that she couldn't believe the bird had flown in such a powerful storm, clearly feeling pity for the poor thing trapped out in the rain. She promised Zeus that she would dry him and keep him warm. She crossed her house and sat by the fire. With a wool cloth, she slowly dried off Zeus, feather by feather. Her touch was so gentle that Zeus wanted to transform and confess his love once more, but he held himself back. Once he was dry, Hera nestled him beneath her bosom, hoping to keep him warm there. Zeus nestled there happily as Hera rocked him. With the fire crackling beside her, she told Zeus some stories, hoping that it would provide the bird with some comfort. With each word, Zeus fell more and more in love with Hera, and Hera grew more and more connected to the precious creature in her arms. Hera spent all night caring for the bird and nursing it back to health. When the time finally came for her to set it free, she decided she would keep the bird with her for the night, at least until the rain cleared. But as she set the bird down in her bed, the bird transformed into Zeus. Hera was shocked to see Zeus standing at the end of her bed. He told Hera once more of his love for her, of her beauty and the compassion with which she treated all living creatures. He spoke of her and her power highly, promising that he would never stop her from doing the things she loved. 
Hera was surprised by how she felt for Zeus at the end of the speech. She knew she had been tricked by him and was certain she would be tricked again. And yet, she knew one day she would have to be wed. And she felt she was lucky to marry a man who loved her as deeply as Zeus seemed to on that rainy night in the cabin. Hera agreed to marry Zeus. Together, they had a secret wedding at the edge of a lake, far from their parents. As a wedding present, Hera was given a tree that bore golden apples. She planted the tree in the garden and visited it nearly every day. It was her prized possession and she was grateful to spend many of her days in the comfort of its shade. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has helped you reach a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.